Hello, everybody. Are we live? Say hello. Say you can see me. Say you can hear me. Let us know where you are if you like. You don't have to. Stop this music, shall we? Take a sip of water. Hmm. How are you all today? People keep saying to me, um, Jamie, I didn't know you played the guitar. I assume that's because there's a, a guitar in the corner there. And um, it's, it's not fair to say that. I've got a friend called Brian, and Brian has got a um, this sort of big, I think it's a sort of antique African spear. He's got it on his wall. And people don't say to Brian, Brian, you've got an antique African spear on your wall. I didn't know you you stabbed people or went around impaling your enemies. Um, so don't don't make assumptions about people just because what you see in their flat. And don't be nosy. Don't go looking in the corners or scrutinizing my walls either, okay? I invite you in here, but you've got to behave. Um, anyway, with that off my mind, how are you all? Can you let me know if you can see me? Um, ah, no. Can't you? You stopped with the music. Okay. Hmm. Yes. Let's come back. How's that? Can you hear me now? Hear me now? I hope you can. Okay, it's all right now. Thank you, Mike. Okay, now. Nice to see you here. Um, there was a few people here and everyone just left when I cut. Oh, they've come back. They've come back. Oh, hello, you're back. Well, I don't know if you, I was just going on about nonsense. I don't know if you heard my nonsense. Dan's in his little garden in Cadith. Tatiana, hello. Mike says, it's okay now. Um, so, yes, Um let me know how, how are you all? Um, I mean, don't have to say how you are. It's too, people ask that too often, don't they? How are you? You might not be very well today. You might be having a bad day. If you're having a bad day, uh, let us know. Maybe you've come here for some some therapy, some photo, photo, thupic, thera, photo therapeutic, photo, th photoputic therapy, photo photoputic therapy that's what you've come from because that's what this is all about um we're looking at photographs it's funny because dan's a friend of mine and we were talking about just the other day weren't we dan about this idea of photographs in the classrooms teachers uh, if you're watching this in the future i hope you're having a nice day and um, let me just introduce myself my name is jamie keddy uh, this is um a lesson stream live. Lesson stream is a community I run, a community of teachers with a passion for story and storytelling in the classroom, some of them present today. And um, what can I tell you about myself? Well, uh, I have written a number of books, three books. Most relevant for this session is a book on images, which I wrote in 2008. So I've been helping teachers to use images in the classroom for over 15 years. I know I don't look that old, but I am. Um, I also run a course uh, in Norwich in the United Kingdom for Norwich Institute for Language Education. I've been doing this for about 15 years as well. This is a course on video, image, and story. Um, and I also um, run the, the Lesson Stream Story course, which is for, for all uh, members get access to this. And image uh, has an important part in this course. And um, what we're doing here, you see all this time I've been teaching or training, I should say, teachers to use image in the classroom. Um, I think I've learned a thing or two. I've got some advice to share. Um, and that's what this is all about. I'm going to be sharing some advice with you. Don't know how you feel about that advice. Um, as teachers, um, I assume you all are teachers. If you're here, you probably are. I'm assuming that you you use image in the classroom, because most teachers do. Um, and I'm assuming that you use photographs. And do you have a favorite photograph? If I say, what's your favorite photograph? Do you think you can answer that question? Um, I think it's a, a, a lesson. Photographs, our own photographs make lesson plans. And but I'm going to share three of mine. Before I show you my three favorite photographs, I want to 
put forward a, 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 cu a couple of principles um, and I want to illustrate these principles with case studies. And I wonder if you know this film. This is a film uh, with Adrian Brody called Detachment. And a Adrian Brody plays this teacher called Henry Barthes. And uh, he's a substitute teacher. He's a bit of a dude. He kind of inspires his students. And a few years ago, um, a clip from this film was circulated. I don't know if it went viral. It was popular. I don't know what the definition of viral is, but it went. It was popular with teachers and it was shared online a lot. And this is how I came to this film through this one clip you see. And uh, Adrian Brody is uh, standing at the front of the class, chalk in hand, and he writes one word on the board, and that word is assimilate. And he says to his students, "What does assimilate mean?" My girl puts up her hand and she says, taking everything in. And he says, exactly, absorbing, that's right. He writes a second word on the board and that second word is ubiquitous. And he says, what about ubiquitous? What does ubiquitous mean? Same girl puts up her hand, same girl. And she says, everywhere, all the time. And he goes, exactly. So then he writes on the board, ubiquitous assimilation. Who can explain what is meant by ubiquitous assimilation? And this young man puts up his hand and he says, taking in everything all of the time. And he goes, very good, Robert. Very good. And then he delivers the killer line, this teacher. He says to his class, how can you imagine anything if the images are always provided for you. And I do love that. How can you imagine anything if the images are always provided for you? And I wonder what you think when you hear those words. I, I think of this. And we're not just talking about teenagers here. Um, well, you know, I think the worst people that uh, my mum and dad are right. I hope they're not listening. They're not. They 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 shouldn't be. Um, they're the worst people I know for their mobile phones. They, they they just they're glued to their screens all the time. But it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> um, but it is sad when you see young people just stuck to their screens. How are you to imagine anything if the images? are always provided for you. And I think that's a really nice way to kind of introduce this, this session. Um, the, second, the second case study that I have for you is from 2007. 2007, do you remember the launch of the product of the decade? The launch of the product of the decade. What am I talking about here? The launch of the product of the decade by a certain Mr. Jobs, Steve Jobs. Uh, there was a, it was a, a, a keynote presentation. It was a, uh, it was a huge, huge event, probably somewhere in California, Silicon Valley, I'm going to guess. And all the media had been called, and they were all sitting in this auditorium, and Steve, and there must have been a lot of things happening to, to to kind of, you know, rile them up, get them excited. Nobody knew what this product was, but they all knew they'd been called to the unveiling of something very, very important. And um, when it was Steve Jobs to stand on the stage, um, what he did, or rather, a better way to say this, what he didn't do, <laughs> what he didn't do was this. Hey, everybody, look, product of the decade, it's an iPhone. Uh, he didn't do that, nor did he display a picture of it on the, on the screen and say, look, everybody, product of the decade. He did not display the image when he stepped onto the stage. What he did was he spent about 10 minutes working the audience, getting them curious, getting them really, really excited. In fact, in fact, he... This is one of, can you see this? This is one of the first uh, images that he, he displayed when he went on there. And almost that Apple, it's like an eclipse, isn't it? The Apple logo being 
the eclipse and it's eclipsing that product which is shining through it's a really powerful way to don't you think that's a really powerful image a really powerful way to introduce the product of the decade i mean that to me is ingenious and um and then he, he, he spent these 10 minutes, he said, uh, you know, every once in a while, a revolutionary new product will come along that changes the world. And uh, we've been lucky enough to work on three of them. And what I have for you today, what I have for you today is, is three revolutionary products. And he said, the first one is a touchscreen iPad. No, no, I, iPod, iPods, whatever happened to iPods. The second one is a, is a telephone another one is a, a new way of, of 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 going online i think and and i think people were kind of led to believe that there was three products here but he says do you see what i'm telling you this is not this is not three products this is one and people were in this frenzy i mean it was crazy uh, I, i'm not one of these so-called apple evangelists at all but this is a, a, a this is very very clever to 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 watch what steve jobs did and to pay attention to what he did um Eventually, he actually, when he did come to unveiling the product and showing us the image, this is what he showed us. Do you remember this? He kind of played a trick on people. This was apparently the, the all new <laughs> iPhone, but it's got this daisy wheel coming from the, the, the iPod era, which wasn't it at all. But for about 10 minutes, he just he just curiosified the audience, which is a word I love, a word I've also made up. <laughs> he curiosified the audience. How did he do that? Well, there was two things, really. The audience was expecting an image. They were expecting to see the product, yet Steve Jobs withheld it. Steve Jobs withheld that product from his audience's view until that moment, bam, the delivery. And Take these two ideas. Number one, Henry Barthos, Adrian Brody. How are you to imagine anything if the images are always provided for you? Number two, Steve Jobs, withholding the image. Now, teachers can learn from this and conference presenters can learn from this. How many times have you been to a conference when the presenter has showed you his next slide and it's an image and then that prompts him to start talking about it? And there's so much potential for making your audience curious by withholding that image, saying something about it first, and then reveal. And that's what I do as a teacher, as a teacher trainer. This is what I try and train my, my teachers to do. And that's what we're going to look at here. So with that in mind, um, let us have a look at the first of these three of my favorite photographs. There's Charlie. Hello, Charlie's lessons. Um, you're in Cadith too, as is Dan. And hello, Erzbet. It's been a while since we've seen you. Hello, nice to see you here. So, let's go into the first of my uh, my three favourite photographs. And uh, this is a this is I, I've been um, working in a, a vocational college here in Barcelona. Uh, for the last month and I've been giving workshops to young young students, some of them as young as 14, um, going up to about 18 or 19 years old. And, and I've been sharing this story with them and it's a story I'm going to tell you. And what I quite like about this story is a great way to, uh, um, it's a great way to, um, to make students remember the difference between the words. These are students, uh, learners of English, don't forget, uh, the, the words embarrassed versus pregnant. <laughs> and uh, that's one quite interesting thing that's come out of this. Now, sometimes, and I don't know if you know where I'm from, but if you don't know where I'm from, I'm from Scotland. This is not the strongest accent you'll have ever heard in your life, but it is a Scottish accent, quite a soft sort of middle class east coast scottish accent and if anyone ever wants me to prove that i'm scottish because scottish people don't have scottish passports but if anyone wants me to prove that i'm scottish i show them this photograph there's me this is the day of my graduation this is 1994 and that is me wearing not a skirt as some people might say, but wearing a kilt. 
very important. And uh, this was taken at the end of the day, I think, at the end of the ceremony. And uh, this is not actually the photograph that I'm, I'm is one of my three favorites, although I am fond of this one. It's there on my parents' wall at home in Scotland. This is, I think, only one of two times in my life when I've worn a kilt. So maybe you think that makes me less Scottish. I don't know. But uh, kilts, uh, not the most comfortable or practical of attire, I think. Attire or attires. Is attire countable or non-countable? I think it's non-countable. Not the most comfortable attire. Um, anyway, I think it was a Wednesday. And I'm stand and, and before that photograph was taken, a few hours before that photograph was taken, I'm standing in my kilt with my full Scottish attire, looking like you just saw me. And I'm standing outside the university, and I'm standing with my, my friend and uh, classmate, Margaret. Margaret is from Ireland. And Margaret had uh, lovely, long red hair, um, which is kind of typical Irish, isn't it, I guess? <laughs> I'm just seeing Daniel's comment, man spreading Scott. <laughs> Daniel, it was my photograph. It wasn't the Metro. If a man can't sp if a man can't spread during his graduation ceremony photograph, when can he? <laughs> So, so I'm standing outside the, the building, the university, uh, where the ceremony is going to take place. And I'm with my friend, um, Margaret. And we were actually a little bit late. In fact, we were one of the last two people in there. I think. And uh, we're just about to go into the building when this photographer and his assistant approach us. And he says, sorry, could I, could I, is it possible... I could take your photograph for the newspaper, photograph for the local newspaper. And we were saying, well, we're a bit of a hurry. We're late. We've got to go into this. I, I, it's okay. Well, we'll just take a moment. So, so I looked at Margaret. Shall we let him? And Margaret said, yeah, let's do it. So, so the photographer said, if I could just take you over here, uh, this is a nice place. And uh, yes. And the photographer took a photograph of Margaret and myself, both looking really good, if I can, if I can be vain enough to say. Uh, and uh, after he took the photograph, he said, could I just ask you, um, are you two by any chance in, in a relationship? And uh, I looked at Margaret and we well, no, we're, we're, we're just friends. We know we've, we've, we're graduating today. We've, we've studied biochemistry um, for the last four years, and it's, we're, we're very good friends. And the photographer looked a bit disappointed, and he said, "Ah, is it is it possible that you know you've you've ever been in a relationship together?" And Margaret went red, you know, the same color as her lovely hair, red with embarrassment, um, a word that's often mistaken in sp Spanish learners because embarazada means pregnant embarrassment is when your face goes red you see and uh, we but no no we've never we've never been in a relationship no no the photographer he didn't give up <laughs> is it possible that one day that one day and margaret was getting really red and so was i about too and no i don't think so we go our own separate ways tomorrow and the photographer was genuinely quite disappointed here and for a number of years, I used to wonder why was he so disappointed? Why did he want us to be in a relationship so much? What was that all about? And I genuinely, genuinely didn't know the answer to that question. And I mentioned I've been teaching these uh, these kids here in Barcelona, and I've been sharing this story with them as part of a, a workshop, uh, which is called the Narratives Workshop. And so this is relevant and I asked them that question, why do you think the photographer was so disappointed? And for me, I think it's a really, really obvious answer to a simple question. And I'm going to assume you know the answer. Feel free to type the answer into the chat if you like. Why was the photographer so disappointed that Margaret and me 
were not in a relationship, never had been in a relationship, and in more and all the by all means seemed that we would never be in a relationship. Why? Would you like to see the, the photograph that came out in the newspaper the next day? Here it is. There's me and there's Margaret. I don't know what happened to Margaret. Um, we lost contact. Um, Mar Margaret, is it Donnelly, her name is? Um, she's probably married. She's probably changed her name. But if anyone knows her, say hello and tell her to drop me a line. Um, so why was this photographer so disappointed that Margaret and me were not an item, we could say? It's quite obvious, isn't it? It's quite a simple answer. If, and there's a nice third conditional coming up, and, uh, you know, you can draw attention to this when you're telling a story. Richard, hello, Richard. <laughs> well, some of your answers. So, um, teacher 10, Spezia, everyone loves a happy ending. That's true, isn't it? Um, and uh, Richard, because you looked compatible. Yeah, I think we did. I think maybe uh, Daniel says, and this is my my kind of interpretation of it, to be Quite simply, um, it makes a better story. And at the end of the day, that's what the media wants. Um, exactly, you know, Federica wanted a story. I mean, it's a story within a story, isn't it? The story of the day is that, you know, it's graduation day. You know, these young scientists, biochemists, and other people from the science faculty are graduating. That's the story. Why not have a picture in the local press? Um, but the story within the story, you know, stories, many stories emerge from with a bigger story. And if he finds a mini story, that photographer is going to go back and get a real good pat on the back. Wow, good find, Arthur. If that was his name, don't know if his name was Arthur, but I think he he could have been an Arthur. Yes. You know what? I always regretted. I always had a big, big regret. I always regretted that I, I didn't lie. I always regretted that I didn't say. When he said, are you in a relationship? I always regretted not acting and saying, you know what? We, we have been in a secret relationship for about a year now. Um, and Margaret is actually pregnant. Um, and we're getting married next week. And you are the very first person outside our families that we've told. And now, Arthur, it's your job to tell the world. Wouldn't that have been so much fun? I would definitely do that now. In that same situation, I would Definitely do it. Can you imagine how much fun that would be the next day when my classmates saw the picture in the local newspaper. What? Jamie and Margaret say what? <laughs> Although I'm not sure how Margaret would have felt about that. <laughs> Who's to say? Yeah, exactly. Margaret might have been surprised by this story. Maybe I could have gone up to the photographer afterwards when margaret was in the ceremony by the way i shouldn't be saying this to you but i'm going to <laughs> and then margaret would have got a big shock as well yeah so that's the first of my my um, three favorite photographs um you know it's not every day is it you get in the newspaper all right it wasn't the front page but still got in the newspaper um, it's funny, I ask a lot of people this question, have you ever been in a newspaper? And in, in my experience, when I've told this story to students, incredibly, well, depending on their age, you often get quite a few people will put up their hands, yes. And they always remember, whether it's their name in a newspaper, whether it's a picture in a newspaper, and we're, we can't count births, by the way, because everybody gets in the newspaper when they're born, at least they do in my country. Um, so, you know, what's your being in the newspaper story? <laughs> um, and by the way, out of the three photographs that I'm showing you today, that's the only one that I didn't actually take myself. But you see how I I I withheld the image. You know, it's you, that, that keeps your students curious. It keeps them engaged. They want to see the image. Um, also, and this is something that 
I, I think really has to be said when we're looking at image in the world of English language teaching. When we think of images in English language teaching, when we think of images in examination, speaking exams, I think images are associated too much with descriptive texts. And that is just really, really misunderusing them. People don't like images for descriptions. You know, you might be attracted to aesthetic, the aesthetics of an image, but you might, you know, not one of these images that you're going to see, by the way, today is a sunset. I'm not into sunsets. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't waste your time with a picture of a sunset that I once saw over in some part of the world. You know, we're looking for stories. And if the image that you're using does not have a story attached to it, then my opinion is that, you know, you're, you're not choosing the best image for the classroom. Human beings love stories. The photographer Arthur loves stories. People buy stories. Arthur wanted a story and that story came or would have come courtesy of a photograph. Human beings love photographs because human beings love stories. And that's a really important point to make. Forget descriptive texts, look for narrative texts. Okay, that's photograph number one. Anyone got anything to say? Anyone got anything to ask? Oh, I'll tell you what, I'm hungry. I haven't had any breakfast today. And my tummy is going like a cement mixer. Brr. I don't know if this microphone's picking it up, but if it is picking it up, I have to apologize. Apologize for my cement mixer stomach. Oh, what a horrible image that is. Sorry. <laughs> right. Now, number two is uh, you, you've. It's very, very possible that you've, you've, you know this this story already because I've used this story in many workshops. Um, I use this story in the lesson stream story course. Um, so you may have, you may be aware of this story. And I'm going to use this story, and I am saying story, although it's a photograph. I'm using this story um, to demonstrate a couple of principles, principles that are very important in the lesson stream story course. Uh, the story behind the photo is more intriguing than the photograph itself. Yeah, I guess that in that case it was, wasn't it, Chris? Um, some photographs are absolutely awesome. There's one photograph in a lesson stream lesson plan, which should be one of my all-time favorite photographs ever by Ian Bradshaw, who caught the photograph of the Twickenham streaker, which in my mind is just one of the best visual narratives we've ever seen. So um, it depends on the image, I would say there. Um, Erzbet says you've started to look for a pic with a narrative from your, you came to Barcelona last summer. Yes. Um, and that's a thing. I, I think, you know, it's a really good mindset to get into, isn't it? You know, go through your photographs and find the photographs with the stories. Now, there's just a, this is a, this is a parenthesis moment. Um, reacting to your comments here. But there's there's three types of narrative or three types of story associated with any image. And the first one is the visual narrative. You know, what's going on in the picture, you know? Um, and let's say perhaps the photograph of the Hindenburg disaster. Um, from 1936, when the, the Hindenburg, which was full of high, um, hydrogen, caught fire, burst into flames, and started sinking down towards the ground. Um, a tragedy and an iconic image, um, very important in the, in, the, in the history of photography. There's an example, a great example of a photograph or an image with a very strong visual narrative. Um, similarly, the photograph I just referred to of the Twickenham streaker, which is this naked man who's just streaked across the, the rugby field, who's now been arrested by policemen. He's got long hair and a beard. He's standing with his outstretched. People comment that he looks like Jesus Christ. And the best thing about the image is it wouldn't have been publishable because of the exposed nudity had it not been for the fact that one of the policemen 
covered up his private parts with a policeman's helmet, uh, which gives the not just make doesn't just make it publishable, but also gives it this comedy. And it's a, it, there's a fantastic one of my favorite lesson plans and lesson she makes use of that. Uh, I, I just it's just occurred to me the the Hindenburg image I referred to is actually made it into this book, uh, my book images. Uh, that's the one I'm talking about, just in case you haven't seen it. This is the first type of narrative involved with an image, and it's the visual narrative, the story that you see. The second kind of narrative is your own personal story, the story behind the picture. So I've just used one of those as an example. The images that you saw, the image of me in the newspaper, there's no visual narrative there to use, that's where you would have to resort to a description, a descriptive text. However, being the, 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 the protagonist or one, one of the protagonists of the image, I've got my own personal story behind the photograph. And that's what we can use. So when you're going through your images in your mobile phone, become aware of these two different types of narrative. The, the visual narrative that is what's happening in the picture. Is it interesting? Is it exciting? Is it worth putting into words and creating a narrative text? Or more likely, your own personal, meaningful story behind that photograph. Um, and sometimes we can use elements of both, which is exactly what we're going to do in this next one. I said there was three. The third type of narrative is narratives that come out with the relationship between the image and the world. So it's not a personal photograph. Um, so it's not a personal image. Sorry. It's not a personal story, nor is it necessarily a story that's involved in the visual narrative, but it's about the narratives that are generated from the world. Let me give you an example. You all know the image VJ Day in Times Square of the sailor who's just returned from Japan, kissing the nurse, who's not actually a nurse, she's a dental assistant. You know, um, you know the, the, all of the stories that have been generated as a result of that image, thousands and thousands, that image always finds itself at the heart of this ever increasingly complex web of stories and narratives. All the different people, for example, who claim to be that couple in the photograph, all the different stories of that image having been recreated, all the times it's been celebrated, discussions of it, the kind of discourse of it, discussions about would it have been as popular had it been taken today? Um, and the answer is very probably no, it would have been had, would have had a very different reaction against it or to it. So let me give you another example. And again, we're going to withhold this second photograph, the second image. It's a photograph that I really, really like. And when I use this uh, with my students, I, I use this um, as a way to demonstrate a, a, a technique that I use a lot, which I call story items. This is not an original technique, but I, I, I I, I use this a lot in the story course. Uh, we apply this to stories that we use. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. What you see on the screen right now, five story items. Number one, a terrifying chicken. Number two, a terrified girl. Number three, July 1983. And number four, a mean big brother. And number five, a quiet village somewhere in France. Um, and as you can probably guess, students have got to refer to these five story items to predict what happens in the story. It's such a great way. I, I, this is an example of what we refer to in the story course, the lesson stream story course, as a story priming device or a story priming technique. There's a whole unit devoted to story priming techniques. And a story priming technique, it prepares students for a story that they're going to read or hear. Um, it also allows them maybe to, to, to put a, a narrative into words, a predictive narrative into words, make a prediction in other words. This is also great for comprehension, you know, because when students come to hear the story, they can kind of map it onto the one that they've created in their in their predictive narratives. And number five, it can allow you to kind of bring into play any unknown words or language 
or language items that students are going to meet. Um, when students do come to make their predictions, there's two ways I like to do this. Number one, just put them into groups or pairs. They work together. They try and predict what happens in the story that they're going to hear. By the way, I'm going to invite you to do this. Um, what do you think happens in the story that you're going to hear? Just based on these five story items, feel free to chat your answers. Uh, sorry, post your answers in the chat. Uh, the other way you can do things, and you're welcome to do this if you prefer, is to ask the teacher closed questions. So feel free if you prefer not to create a narrative, to write a story, which should be a bit more time consuming, to ask me a question in the chat. Of course, I suffer, as so many teachers do, from that terrible, terrible condition that prevents us um, from giving anything but a yes or no answer called yes and no itis. You know what I'm talking about. Um, so, but my eyes are in the chat, bearing in mind there's a 15 second delay. Richard asks, um, it's not a real chicken, of course. So I'm gonna turn this into a closed question from Richard. Oh, that is a closed question, isn't it? It's not a real question of chicken, of course. Yes, Richard, it actually is a real chicken. The terrifying chicken in this story is a real chicken, which is a really good question to ask. It's a key, key question. Chris asks, was the girl very young? Um, she was, I'm going to guess, she was, um, she was 11 years old, so very young. Does that qualify for very young? It's very young for me, but if you're 15 years old, you probably wouldn't call a 13-year-old girl very old, but I'm going to guess most of us here would guess very young. Um, hello, Gaylene. How are you? Um, nice to see you here. Um, older than you imagined. Daniel says, does the brother set this chicken on his poor sister? Actually, no, he doesn't. The, the, the mean big brother um, didn't actually set the chicken on his sister. For example, he didn't catch the chicken and uh, throw it at her or place it beside her. Nothing like that. Um, Jim and Julie, I think, Julie, that is, picturing your brother terrorizing you when you were kids, threatening to lock you in the chicken coop with a nasty rooster. Oh, my God. That's that's like that scene from Sixth Sense, isn't it? When the, the little boy gets locked in the cupboard with all the, the, the dead people because he can see dead people. Terrifying. Um, but, you know, uh, chickens are more terrifying than dead people to some. It's all subjective, isn't it? Um, did the brother put on a terrifying chicken costume? <laughs> no, he didn't. But I like that question. Is the chicken alive? Uh, yes, the chicken was very much alive. So, okay, that's what we call story items. Uh, let me demonstrate to you a second technique, which is called a storytelling gap fill. And for a storytelling gap fill, um, we, we start with some individual words or phrases, the ones that you see in front of you. These are taken from the text, from the story text, which I've already prepared, already written, very important to this technique, giving them to students. You can write them on the board. You can write them down on LPOPs, if you like. Do you know what LPOPs are? LPOPs are little pieces of paper, very technical terms. Sorry if that went over some of your heads. Write them on little piece of paper, distribute them, get students to memorize them, pass them around, whatever you do. You want to get these phrases out there. And you want students to be able to see them on the board or on the table if they're LPOPs, because what you're going to do next is you're going to tell the story. Um, there's something I meant to do before um, we went live today. So I'm going to ask you a favor. Could you all just close your eyes for one moment while I just quickly take a photograph of the next slide? Close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. Good people, thank you for closing your eyes. You can open your eyes now. Um, I'll come back in just a moment. There we are. Yes. So let me give you back the phrases. What you, These phrases, by the way, 
I wouldn't call these story items because um, the difference between what you see on the screen here and the story items is I always recommend no more than story items. The job of the story items is specifically to give enough information for students to try and predict what happens in the story. Story items are about the content of the story. On the other hand, what we see here is much more about the story from a linguistic point of view, the language, the story text. And the reason I'm giving these phrases to students is for a different purpose. I'm not really asking students to predict what happens, although I could. Let me tell you the story. This is a story telling gap fill. The year is 1983. 1983, and um, it's summertime, and I'm on holiday with my parents, my mum and dad, my little sister Susie, so 1983, let me just work this out. I was 11 years old in 1983. My little sister in 1983 was nine years old. So if I said the little girl was nine years old before, I was wrong. She was actually um, nine years old. And also my little baby brother Alistair was there. He was just a baby. Can't work out how old he was. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, we were on holiday in France, summer holidays. It's funny, we always used to go to France for our summer holidays. And so they were, the five of us. Now, that summer, I was getting... Now, that gesture means fill the gap. And students have got to choose the phrase that they see in front of them to fill the gap. There's different ways you can do this, different ways to manage it. You can just shout out answers if you like. But what is the gap? What is the missing phrase? So let me say it again. I was on holiday in France with my family. 1983, I was 11 years old. My sister was nine years old. My little baby brother was there. We were on holiday in France. Um, and that summer, I was getting... Exactly. Richard got it into photography. Erzbert got it into photography. Exactly. I had a new camera and I was taking, again, fill the gap. Um, and as I mentioned, you can do this the sort of chaotic way so students can just shout out answers or you can nominate. Students are not allowed to shout out answers. You've got to, you don't let them put up their hands. There's no point in putting up your hands. Otherwise, students can just switch off. You've got to choose a student. What do you think there? Um, you know, that summer I was getting into photography. I had a new camera and I was taking, fill the gap, fill the gap. It's going to come through any second now, any second now, just waiting to catch up with this 15 second gap. No, it's not coming. I think you just can't be bothered, can you? So I was taking photographs of everything I saw. So you get the idea here. Now, there was one day during the holiday when we were walking, the gap to be filled obviously is through a village. Ah, there the answers are coming in now. Must be a longer delay than 10 seconds. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ask you to type anymore because we get the idea. So there was one day during the holiday when we were walking Sorry, yeah, we were walking through a village. And in the village square, there was, notice the intonation, very important here, there was a big chicken. Now, suddenly, for no apparent reason, the chicken ran towards my sister and cornered her. <laughs> Now, for my sister, this this was this was a terrifying situation. She thought, I suppose, she thought that the chicken was going to attack her, and she started to cry. That's it. And for me, of course, for Jamie, whose new hobby was photography, this was my big opportunity. This was my the, my my entry into the world of photojournalism, you know? So so as quickly as I could, I, I took out my camera, tried to focus it, 
tried to get the settings right, take a picture of the scene in front of me. 40 years later, my sister still hasn't forgiven me. <laughs> Let me just say something about this, uh, this technique. I mentioned before, it's very, very important that you prepare your text, obviously, because you've got to know the specific phrases to isolate from it. And when you tell the story, you've got to have the text in hand. Um, you've got to practice reading it aloud, get that intonation right so students can hear that the, the sentence is incomplete as well as see through your gesture. And you've got to know exactly when to stop. That's why those phrases are there underlined and in bold. So that's the secret. There's one thing missing, of course, isn't there? And that thing is the photograph. Would you like to see it? <laughs> I love that. That is Susie. I tell you what, I haven't asked her permission to broadcast this live. I wonder how she'll feel about this. Um, great, eh? While I have you, just a little parenthesis moment, I could ask you a big, big favor. If you enjoy these lesson stream lives, could you subscribe to my YouTube channel if you done, haven't done it already? Give this video a thumbs up. And also, if you, if you could do so, I never ask people to do this because I'm always a bit shy about doing it. Please, you can share this video, you know. Once this is over, the same link is where you'll find the recording. So you can just, you can just copy that link, paste it in your Facebook groups on LinkedIn, wherever you, you like and just recommend it to your teacher friends. I would really, really appreciate that because I do work very hard um, at preparing these for you. Um, so thank you very much in advance for doing that. And sorry to my little sister. Hey, I'll tell you one thing that's very interesting about image. For, for years, I fell into a trap. I fell into this trap um, as teachers often do of, of, of underusing the image, or rather underusing the story. What I used to do as a novice teacher is I would take this image into the classroom, I would cover up the chicken, you know, with a black blob. And I'd say to students, hey, look at this picture. This is my little sister. Why do you think she's crying? And students would definitely be curious. Students would be engaged. There's no doubt about that. And I would use this as a way to teach models of deduction. It might be a cat. It could be a dog. It could be a mouse. It can't be an elephant, you know, which is just, it's a terrible thing to suffer from grammar blindness, to let this idea that our role as a teacher is to teach grammar McNuggets, as Scott Thornbury calls them, and let that dictate everything we do. And what suffers? Well, the story suffers and the, the, the students are denied an experience. That is not the way to use this, the, the, the story. Now, you can cover up images if it's part of a bigger activity. But ultimately, what I'm doing here is I'm using a photograph of my own, um, or rather what I should say, I'm using the story behind it. I'm getting students really involved in the text. That's the text that we've seen. After having done this storytelling gap fill, I would give them access to these phrases, ask them to reconstruct the text. In doing so, they're going to have to reconstruct four or five past perfect structures, as well as a couple of past simple structures. So this is a really good way for comparing aspect. Um, and then, this is the important part, they go off to find a photograph of their own, one that has a story behind it, and they've got to prepare the story. So this is the teacher setting up, up a task, leading by example, sharing a story, providing a model, then giving things over to students. So they've got to do it themselves. This, when you just cover up an image, and use it to teach models of deduction, that's just parsley, you know, nothingness. It, it's just, it's just, it, it's, teachers have been, been led to believe that that's our job, to be grammar, grammar teachers. And it's just such a shame. 
And anyway, if you really want to teach models of deduction, that's always going to be there when we're using story. It's always going to be there when we're using image. I could ask students, I could ask you, why do you think this chicken did what it did on that day? What were its motives? What were its incentives? Then we can start to use models of deduction. You know, I've asked a lot of people this. A lot of people think the chicken was, maybe it was going to attack her. It, it might have been a, a, a violent chicken. It, it could have um, been blind. Uh, I'm not into model deductions, but I'm just showing you. I think that its, uh, it's idea was it was being friendly. It was a French chicken. This is my theory. It was a French chicken. It was learning English. And back in those days, um, it, it didn't have much opportunity to, to practice its English uh, because it was a sleepy little village. There weren't that many tourists. And uh, it, it saw my sister's T-shirt, that English world, hello. And the chicken just wanted to come and speak to my sister and practice its English. That's my, my theory. Uh, thank you, Julie, for your nice comment there. Incredibly helpful advice. I, mighty fine. Sure do appreciate it. Right. Let's move on to the last photograph of the day. This will be a bit quicker than the others. Um, on Tuesday, I'm going to Lisbon to take part in the API conference, which starts on Friday, a week today. Um, so I'm going to be at API, the National um, uh, Portuguese English Teachers Conference. And I'm going to be presenting this this uh, activity there. So if you're going to be there, you don't maybe you don't want to watch this next part. I don't know. Up to you. Um, so this is a nice sort of way to just mention what we were talking about before. This is a photograph um, that I took in what year was it? Ten years ago. So this would be 2012, and the photograph has been cropped. The question to you is, what is going on here? What is going on here? If I'm using this with my students, I would not tell them that I took this photograph. You already know that. Um, students don't know that. Um, and students have got to come up with theories. And maybe those theories could be sentences. Maybe they could be more elaborate ideas. Maybe they could be questions to you, the teacher. And this is a great way. This is another example of what we referred to before as a story priming technique. This is the second one that we've looked at in the, in the lesson stream story course. As I mentioned, there are 12 in the unit on storytelling, story priming techniques. This is a story priming technique. It's a means to an end. And one of the great things about this is it gets your students curious and it can also get them producing language. And it's also setting them up for comprehension of the story which is coming next. But importantly, it's a means to an end. It is not the activity in itself. It's not just use this, get students speaking, then show them the image. All right, it could be a part of a slideshow, a bigger slideshow of images which you've set up. That, that's fine. But we're focusing on one single story here. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to tell you the story. And this, what you see in front of you, is an example of what I call a story pathway, another really important technique that we use a lot in the Lesson Stream Story course. And I use this so much. I've been using this technique in these workshops I've been talking about in Barcelona. If there's ever instructions I've got to give, a little short story I've got to tell, an explanation I've got to provide, I will often create a story pathway, display it on the board so that students can negotiate through that teacher monologue that they're going to hear, which is in this case, a short story. Picture this. It's 2012, and I'm in Edinburgh with my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather's name is Richard, uh, sadly no longer with us, but he was a, a fine man. And uh, I, interestingly, I don't know if you know this, I'm, I am half named after my grandfather because Richard uh, is my middle name. So I am Jamie Richard Keddy. And when I was at school, I used to be absolutely terrified, terrified that the other kids would discover that Richard was my middle name. Can you guess why I was terrified that they would? Can you guess why I was so terrified? The, the, the reason is, is that 
the the name Dick is short for Richard. And back in the day, my my grandfather was often called Dicky. Back in the war, he was known as Dicky or Dick, which was fine back then, but not in not when you're a child. You know, a few decades ago, nobody wanted to be called Dick, which everybody knew that Dick was short for Richard, and I didn't want to be called Dick for obvious reasons. Can't believe I'm sharing this with you now. Don't call me Dick, please. <laughs> So um, I am half named after my grandfather, my grandfather, Richard. So I'm standing in the street with my grandfather. We're standing outside a restaurant in Edinburgh, and it's my 40th birthday. You see, my grandfather is taking me and my parents out to lunch, which is very nice, don't you think? I don't know why my parents got in there. I mean, it was my birthday. I suppose no. I think I think mothers. I think in fact I think mothers should get all the praise and glory for any child's birthday. I'm sure mothers will agree. Fathers, not so sure, but I think all the gifts should go to the mothers. I really believe that. I don't know why the child gets anything at all, really, when the mother did all of the work. The more I think about that, the more I think what mothers go through. Oh, my sisters tell. This is a digression. Let's not go there. Anyway. 2012, Edinburgh, me, my grandfather, standing in the street outside a restaurant that we're going to go into, and we are waiting for my mum and dad to arrive. Now, this restaurant is was beside an, an antiques shop, and just outside the antiques shop, there was a statue of a man, and this man was completely naked, as naked as the day he was born, you might say, although statues aren't born in conventional ways like human beings are and he was just standing there with crossed arms you see and there was this sign over his private parts so you couldn't see this naked statue's private parts and the sign said we are open of course which referred to the antiques shop not uh, not anything else and my granddad thought this was quite funny um, and I said to him, well, you know, why don't I, I take a photograph of you with the statue? And he said, good idea. So he, he stood beside the statue and he put his arm around it. And I took one photograph. And I'm going to show you this photograph. Here is the photograph. Let's look at this a bit more carefully. Um, there's the photograph. I wonder if this is how you expect it to, to look. Again, this is with holding the image. Did you see how curious you were there? How engaged in the text you were because you hadn't yet seen the photograph, just like Steve Jobs' audience back in 2007. Such a, uh, such a, a, a powerful technique, and uh, I call this picture telling. Um, but there was a problem with this photograph. I don't know if you can see. This is a, a question to students. Can you see the problem with this photograph? Uh, and the problem is that my granddad, he wasn't looking at the camera when I took the picture. I don't know what he was looking at. Maybe he was getting ready. Maybe he, he I don't know. He, but he, I said, granddad, you know, when, you, when somebody takes a photograph of you, it's customary to look at the camera. So let's take a second picture. So that's what we did. So in the second picture, my granddad was looking at the camera. I pressed the shutter, took the photograph, but at that exact moment, something unexpected happened. Can you guess what it was? What's the unexpected thing that happened? Who can guess what it was? I'm not going to wait for answers because of our 20-second delay. I'm just going to show you. This is what happened. The sign fell off and the private parts were exposed. <laughs> the sign fell off. The private parts were exposed. This was a completely natural photograph, not a setup. And don't you just love my grandfather's facial expression of shock and surprise. <laughs> you got it, didn't you? The sign fell off. The sign fell off. The wind blew, says Chris. I think it was maybe my grandfather's wandering hand at the back. <laughs> I accidentally untied that cord, I guess. 
or at least caused it to untie itself. So that's the idea. That was a great. That it, what what what's quite interesting about this for me is that I am always looking for photographs to use for for picture telling activities, and yet it's only recently, and I, I hadn't forgotten about this image, but it was only recently that it occurred to me. Hi, ah, you know what? That's a great image to use in the classroom. Why have I? Why has it never occurred to me to use this image before? And rather than going into any sort of deep thought, but how am I going to use it? What can I possibly do with it? It's simple. Use the story. Use the story. And what makes this so great is the story without that photograph would have been quite mundane, quite boring. I mean, what, what there wouldn't have been a photograph, you know? Um, even if the exact story had happened, but I'd lost the photograph, it'd be a terrible story to share. You know, it would have been a forgettable moment. But you, so the language of the, the, the chicken and my sister, there was so much great language there, but coming from very mundane uh, events in France on holiday, walking through a village, there was a chicken, it ran towards my sister, it cornered her, etc., etc. So let me just share with you very quickly four principles that come out of the, the picture telling unit of the story course, which we'll be starting in the next few months. Oh, thank you, Gaylene. Uh, that's part of the job to make you laugh. So I'm glad I did that. One. Um, so, so four ideas, four principles. Um, and number one is there's no image without a text, no text without an image. So when you're working with a photograph, there's always a text. Often we think of descriptive texts, but the best kind of text that we're looking for are narrative texts, in other words, stories. Conversely, there's no text without an image in the sense that you read a text and you visualize. Visualizing is a key part of making meaning. In other words, visualization is a key part of comprehension. And this is a, a key idea that we go into in the Lesson Stream Story course a lot. So no image without a text, no text without an image. Number two, withhold the image. I don't think I need to explain that because we've mentioned it a few times and demonstrated it three times. Be Steve Jobs. Number three, narrative texts over descriptive texts. I've said this again, look for stories. That photographer back in 1994 took the photograph of me and Margaret. He wasn't looking for a descriptive text to accompany the photograph. He was looking for a story because that's what human beings want. They say that every picture tells a story, don't they? Nobody ever says every picture is associated with a descriptive text. That would be rubbish. Every picture tells a story. And number four challenges that idea. They say that every picture tells a story, but they are wrong. Every picture does not tell a story. Human beings tell stories in response to pictures, and the stories that we tell are all different. This is not an ex this is not a principle that we've explored in this session, but it's a very key principle that we explore in the the other workshop that I mentioned earlier, the narratives workshop, um, which uh, I've been given I, I give to schools, which explores things like uh, stereotypes prejudices, generalizations, the media, and stuff like that. So those are my four principles. Um, who wants to have the last word? If you want to have the last word, type it into the chat. And um, that's, I mean, that's all for today. That's all I've got for you. We've gone four minutes over time. I'd like to say a big, huge thank you to all of you for, for attending. Once again, it would mean a lot to me if you can like subscribe and share this video just copy paste it into any social media or whatever you want to do and i will be eternally grateful in your debt so um last words for this 20 second delay i don't see any coming in so i'll just say thank you so much uh federica very interesting very nice very kind thank you Oh, DJ, sorry you're off by an hour. If you've just turned up, DJ, don't worry. You can this. You can watch this again. Just start it from the very beginning. Refresh it. 
in two or three minutes and you'll be able to watch the recording. All right. Thank you, Richard. And um, always a pleasure, Richard, a key lesson stream member there. Always nice to see you. Thank you, Meg. Thank you, DJ. Sorry, thank you, Julie. Thank you, DJ. And I'm going to hang up now. You have a great day. Have a great weekend. Um, I'll see you uh, at the le next lesson stream live. Thanks so much, Arjbit. Thanks so much to all of you. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye now. Bye.